e-commerce now it's b to c our airlines have no transparency they all know they also know there is another route also to make money doesn't mean that they're shunning forwarders there is also a piece of pie the pie is now uh, you know it's sliced differently Hello, my name is Lakshmi Ajay. I'm an associate editor with Stack Media, and today I'm in conversation with Mukund Parthasarthi. He's a senior vice president at Revenue Technology Service. Thanks for joining us in this conversation, Mukund. Thanks, Lakshmi, for this opportunity. Mukund, I wanted to start by asking you: since you manage revenues for Air Cargo and logistics players, could you share an approximate share of where they invested into which segments? What are some segments that take the lion's share? Has there been a shift or change in this, and what are the changes? For this question, could you also so speak with respect to air cargo and rail no problem at all so bulk of the investment typically in an air cargo organization uh, lakshmi goes to more on the operational side because uh, when as you know that air cargo is behind passenger side in terms of automation itself so a lot of the systems they use especially reservations and operations and everything are kind of legacy systems so bulk of the investment would go into that automation of warehousing uh, now you have the robots and the drones coming into picture that's where the bulk of the investment is going on what has changed post pandemic is because of the advent of machine learning and artificial intelligence there is a lot more scope or airlines are looking to investing in that because they understand reservations operations a lot of these you know automation projects that they have invested improves productivity no doubt at all it improves the you know the people that were working in these fields but it doesn't actually add anything to the top line or bottom line if i implement any of these solutions not that my revenue is going to go up or my margins are going to go with artificial intelligence and machine learning based algorithms whether it's revenue management or dynamic pricing or sales budgeting they have figured out that hey this can improve my basis points by 3% 4% which is a big deal if you're managing a business of let's say 2 billion or 4 billion if someone says hey if you invest in this particular algorithm my revenue is going to go over by 3 or 4% you will take it mm-hmm. because the investment they make in this algorithm is very 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 minimal so you see a slight shift but if you're looking for numbers wise that right, i would still say on a yearly because it's a capital intensive industry uh 80 to 90% of the revenue would go into the operational side of things only 10% comes to decision support systems like ours mm-hmm. so that's the biggest shift i've seen post pandemic yeah. before it was 95 and 5% now it's slowly you know anywhere between 85 to 90 on the operational side and then 10% on the side risk mitigation has become important in air cargo operations right so how do you factor that in the solutions that you offer these companies our solutions a couple of things right uh, one is our solutions apart from directly connecting to revenues or improving margins one of the things airlines are very very careful is the customers they serve typically air cargo is called as a b2b right you're talking about dealing with forwarders and they're not a lot of them unlike the passengers passenger side each one of us as a consumer you're talking about millions and millions of customers from the cargo you're talking about the top forwarders you're looking at 20 to 30 so they are very very careful in terms of mitigating risk what they mean by that is hey i need to make sure my connectivity my service level so that is met or satisfied by the or like i'm satisfying the requirement for the forwarder so i'm not pissing her or him off they take the business to an airline right across the street so when we forecast whether it's capacity or the prices we have to keep that in mind saying that there is only a limited tolerance in terms of how aggressive airlines can be with respect to pricing or the kind of products they want to give to their forwarders a digitalization of cargo operations is important for both sustainability initiatives as well as driving efficiencies in cargo ops i believe the rds cargo suite has been a market leader in helping companies drive profitability through the multiple solutions for site accelerate velocity could you shed some light on how rt solutions can also help airlines further their sustainability mission and what aspects of your products can help aviation become greener so the two things we have started doing again sustainability as a term as a concept has been in existence existence for a while i think the whole e airable initiative this all came from saying that hey we need to have a paperless environment and so on kind of indirectly connected to sustainability but what we're doing the last few years is we started tracking the carbon footprint and the safs 
the amount of SAF an airline is using. Now, where do we use it is, one is transparency in kind of providing this data, and eventually the airlines can also differentiate their products. Let's say, you know, you have an airline who's carrying a lot of SAF. Now, they can say that, hey, the cargo products carried in this equipment can be priced differently. And there are a group of people who want to kind of encourage this as some, you know, if you're very conscious about, you want to leave the earth in a much better place than what how we took off our children. So you want to make sure that, hey, I'm willing to pay that extra price because the airline is kind of carrying SAF and so on. So the carbon offset and the SAF is something that we kind of incorporate as part of our velocity as well as uh, accelerate tools. So they can track that? Yes. Yes. We know that uh, digitalization and sustainability are two mega trends that have been embraced by the aviation and the air cargo sectors post pandemic. Does sustainability figure in the revenue, sales planning, budgeting, and management decisions of air cargo and logistics players? How big of a component is it, and how do you see it growing in the coming years as the focus shifts to sustainable businesses in the coming years? If you ask me, you know, but. Because the last three years, there's kind of an anomaly in air cargo in so many ways. One is, you know, the percentage of air cargo as, as a revenue share in an airline is different. So there wasn't much focus on sustainability. They just wanted to survive as an airline and cargo helped saving the airline, right? What they have started doing now is especially, you know, you, you take, uh, take some of our customers, whether it's United or Delta and everything, they've slowly, they're starting to incorporate that saying that, hey, how do we keep flying cargo or transporting cargo in a sustainable way, which means as a planning perspective and the schedules are published and so on, they are kind of taking that into consideration. Which are the areas where we can incorporate that in the forecasting so that we, you know, the end result is I can kind of, one is not only market to their forwarders, truly believe that this is going to save the world. Is digitalization a big component of your solutions? What technological tools are used in deriving data and insights that can aid customers in verticals like revenue management, cargo revenue management, pricing, sales, budgeting and scheduling? So digital, that's all we brief. You know, everything, obviously, we're a software solution provider, so everything is digital. Now, specific to tools and everything, right? So, we have multiple solution kit, uh, solutions in our toolkit. Uh, you spoke about revenue management and pricing and uh, sales budgeting and, uh, you know, uh, revenue forecasting. In all of these tools, I think the key, the brains behind the system is, you know, the two terms you normally hear is forecasting and optimization. How are you forecasting and how are you optimizing? And most of them are, these are mathematical models. Essentially, you put something in its history, it comes of spits out and saying, I'm predicting this. What has changed is machine learning and artificial intelligence. When you talk about machine learning and there is supervised machine learning, unsupervised and so on. Meaning, slowly you don't need a lot of human intervention in managing these models. Mm -hmm. Right? Meaning, it is going to kind of adapt a little bit more faster. I think uh, now everyone in the world is talking about chat GPT. It's a narrative AI. So now, RTS, like we're also thinking, hey, how do we incorporate some of these narrative AI in our tools? For example, if someone is looking for an allotment a request and so on. Should they go type in, in a solution or wherever they're typing or should they speak to it? So, you know, these are again uh, in a, at a very infant stage in terms of we are doing some prototypes and so on. But artificial intelligence and machine learning are kind of where we're investing a lot to take the digitization to the next level. RTS says offices in India, UK and Africa. Are there any plans to expand its presence and what are the markets from where the company foresees its next round of growth to come from? Phenomenal growth for us. There was some dark times during the pandemic, right? Uh, one part of our business really suffered the passenger side because people were not flying. Mm -hmm. If people are not flying, airlines are not going to make money, which means they can pay a vendor like this. But um, a few things, right? We stuck through, the airlines stuck through our tiers. We, we kind of stuck through. We never laid off anyone. But back to the question on expansion itself, right? One thing we did is we went global before. We were a very straight jacket kind of a company. We had an office in Dallas, uh, Cape Town, Nottingham. And then in India, we had it in Chandigarh. But once uh, we went complete remote hybrid workplace, now we have in India itself, we have offices in Hyderabad, Bangalore. Chandigarh, then a uh, few in Pune and Gurgaon. And then in North America, now we have in Canada as well. I think our next expansion plan is to make sure that uh, uh, in Central America, we're looking at Costa Rica and Colombia as one of those places we want to expand. Uh, one is where strategically we want to is we want to be close to the customers in the time zone. That's where it is. And obviously India is like unbelievable talent. So we want to have it there, which can service a lot of Asia and uh, the Middle East region. For Europe, obviously 
UK is kind of like a central to us and we're looking at um, Germany as another place and then for North America is going to be Dallas and uh, and uh, Canada and eventually Costa Rica and Colombia but uh, majority of the workforce will always be in India. Air cargo is going through a rough patch uh, what with muted consumer demand inflationary pressures and geopolitical challenges on many fronts. What would you say is the outlook for this year going forward after an extraordinary two years for the air cargo industry? Lakshmi I'm not sure if you saw the uh, speech this morning uh, from the IIT economists and everything, right? My viewpoint is very similar. I don't think the yields are that bad. If you compare it with 2021 and 22, obviously it's significantly down. But if you compare it to pre-pandemic, I think we're still doing better. If you compare the numbers between pre-pandemic and 2023, I think it's better. It can be better. Obviously, airlines, the groups are also organizations are used to kind of the numbers that we had. You know, there was a time, I think it was $10 per kilo and so on and capacity was constrained. Now, I think the new normal is people have started flying. So, belly capacity is constrained and so on. The yields will never be what it was during the pandemic. But if you ask me the rest of the year, I think after second quarter and third quarter, you'll start seeing it going north. It is a well-documented fact that the air cargo sector is a lag when it comes to adopting digitalization in its daily operations. Although sweeping changes have come in the form of bookings, airway bills or one record and cold chain verticals have also seen significant digitalization. Why do you think digitalization is moving at a slow pace in the industry when we have technologies like blockchain that have the potential to change the dynamics of work? in air cargo? It's a chicken and egg thing, right? I think uh, one, there are two, we can look at it from multiple aspects. One is, hey, the revenue share in an airline cargo, because, you know, unless until you're all, you know, if you're not an all cargo airline, if you're a passenger airline carrying cargo, the revenue share is anywhere 7 to 8% before and now, you know, now it's kind of, you have a real seat in the table. So when you have that, now people are saying, like, I have to invest. Hey, if I 20% of my revenue, you better invest in the business. Whether it's an operational area, warehousing or drones or, you know, solutions like ours, they are starting to invest. Now your question is why? Before they thought this is like a, you know, almost like a retirement community. You know, I've done all my work on the passenger side. Now I get, you know, I move to the cargo you know, and then I just fade off. That has changed now. When you see bigger revenue, airlines are really putting a cargo person leading, you know, there's several examples, leading the show. And they're also, I think, marketing air cargo to younger people. That's one thing that will change. I've, at least I've, cha- I've seen a change in my time. The last 10, 15 years, I, you know, we work with quite a few customers, airline customers, and a lot of younger people coming in, which is great. If they are mentored and you kind of see them as the future leaders. So you will see this because the younger bunch is a lot more technology savvy. They're not going to put up with the slower response times and legacy-based system. It has to be, you know, this is the, t- you know, Snapchat, Instagram kind of a generation. They are used to having everything in fingertips. Mm-hmm. So that's the, I think, the, drastically you'll see changes. Even the whole, uh, you know, the marketplace where, uh, with, you know, uh, the portals where you now airlines are sharing capacity and prices and so on. You know, it just happened in the last two, three years. Yeah, the air cargo community systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, there are freighters, there's uh, Cargo One and uh, quite a few of them, right? Yeah. yeah. So I um, wanted to understand that, you know, since uh, you mentioned uh, digitalization, about digitalization, uh, is there any shift in terms of revenues of companies uh, towards these solutions? Is there a big shift? Yeah, definitely. I think these add a significant revenue and margin improvement. A lot of times uh, people don't forget about margins or profits is that revenue is great, but the the way at price point at where you're selling this car, are you making money? I think that's where, you know, revenue management systems or dynamic pricing kind of helps you because it also takes variable costs, fixed costs into consideration and saying that, hey, every shipment I ship, I need to make some money. So definitely there's a shift. E-commerce has been a sweet spot for the industry during the pandemic and it also changed some fundamental, you know, uh, basic ways of doing things. So um, what what, what would you say that has been an irreversible shift because of e-commerce? Irreversible shift is airlines was just considering this is a B2B, as in they never had direct interaction with the end shipper. You know, I go, you know, let's say I'm a big airline, I go talk to a forwarder like Panalpina, Kunana Nagal, that's about it, right? I really had no visibility in terms of who's shipping to Panalpina and so on. E-commerce, now it's in to ship. Now, airlines have no transparency. They, all know, they also know there is another route also to make money. Doesn't mean that they're shunning forwarders. 
there is also a piece of pie. The pie is now, uh, you know, it's sliced differently. So there is a portion where airlines want to grab that and that is an irreversible shift. That pie will start growing and growing. Last year saw the aviation sector struggle with labour issues in many parts of the world owing to wages, poor working condition, lifestyles and lack of incentives. The pandemic also contributed to a lot of talent leaving the industry as flights were grounded in 2020 owing to the pandemic. As a solutions provider for the air freight industry, what would be your take on how to attract and retain talent uh, in the aviation sector? What kind of policies and opportunities do you think should be made available to newer talent? I think uh, for us, we also caught off guard when you know we had offices I used to go to work you know we had a policy of working from home a day or two in a week globally and it was also not very kindly looked upon even though you know let's say a position doesn't really require uh, to be interfacing with someone else it, we always thought this is a good thing in terms of from a camaraderie team spirit collaboration and so on I still strongly feel when we had this uh, this pandemic hit us, you know, we had to go complete remote because we still had customers we had to support and also we were implementing new solutions. I think we did three implementations in, during the pandemic, all sitting at home and everything. Now, once the pandemic faded away, we said, okay, it's back to normal. Let's just go back to work and everything. And we thought, hey, we'll do a survey internally trying to find out what do employees feel. They all said, if you're going to mandate me coming back to work, I will do it, but without a smile. That was a red flag for me. And essentially what the employees are saying is, I'm not really happy. So at next given opportunity, if there is another job, I'm going to move out. I don't want to lose people. How do you retain talent and how do you attract new talent? The labor market and in most of the places where we have employees, whether it's India or US or Canada, it is very, very strong. It's not easy to hire good resource, someone with the basic knowledge. So we basically went full remote, right? So this is attracted big time in terms of uh, access to talent, any part of the world. Uh, flexibility and work-life balance seems to be the most important thing to younger people. Uh, we talked to several airlines and sometimes airlines are a little bit more conservative. Rightfully so, they are in the business of transporting people. They have to come to work. They also feel they are losing talent if they are very, very strict about, hey, I need everyone to come into work from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock and so on. I think that that is an irreversible change you want to, for us also, uh, if we want to attract talent, it is going to be a hybrid environment. A lot of people want that balance. They don't want to be like a 8 or 9 hour job. They want to kind of work one month from a different city, we kind of encourage that. But again, there is also has to be a balance, the emotional, or the, you know, the uh, mental health. Uh, sometimes when you work from home, you don't meet people. So we kind of do creative ways of, you know, group lunches and dinners and, and you know, get togethers more often. The, the real estate cost has gone down. The budget for travel and some of these has gone up. So, you know, overall, but the best thing is employees are happy. Uh, they don't know driving two hours, especially in a city like Bangalore and so hot. Uh, you know, we, I was in Bangalore, uh, November, December. And I said, hey, you know, how many of you? They said, no. You know, the moment you say I have to come into work every day, then that's a, a showstopper for them. So hybrid uh, culture is the way. To I think the way to go. Yeah. You don't want to go complete remote also. Uh, ideally, you want to have a couple of days at least, everyone to be in the office. So you kind of, I, you know, you, you gain so much, you know, get to know about each other personally also. So thank you, Mukun, for this conversation. Thank you, Lakshmi, really for giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you. Okay. 